my name is Anna Lerner. Um, I work at Facebook. Uh, I sit in the Project 17 team and I lead our data for SDGs efforts. I'm here to talk to you about uh, advancing gender equality uh, with private sector data. Um, this pertains to the, section, to the session around non-traditional big data sources for women's empowerment. As I mentioned, uh, I work at Facebook. Um, I'm part of a team that's called Project 17. Um, we think of ourselves as Facebook's long-term partnership strategy for supporting the advancement of the global goals, the sustainable development goals. Uh, we're particularly focused on leveraging partnerships um, and Facebook's unique capabilities to uh, drive progress on the goals. So um, as you might tell from our name, Project 17, we are focused on SDG 17, which is obviously the partnership uh, goal. It also focuses a lot on some of these enablers um, that are needed across all the goals, uh, knowledge, capacity building, uh, capital, data and technology. Um, so we think of that, we think it's a good fit for sort of Facebook's unique capabilities. Um, on this slide, you can see um, how we've structured our thinking internally around where we think Facebook can contribute. These are our six we call them our six superpowers, um, where we think we can really drive outsized impact on the goals. Um, and um, we started off with data and insights, um, but throughout, uh, throughout the coming years, we will expand to the other areas as well and, and, and expand our partnerships in those areas. So why data and insights? Well, um, this is no news to you all, um, but the UN keeps reminding us that um, there's substantial lack of data um, to inform policy and investments around the SDGs, even to monitor progress, to be honest. 68% um, of the SDG indicators are missing data. Um, you see a couple of other um, quotes here that really point to the, the fact that um, without uh, reliable, accurate, and timely data, it's really hard to um, achieve these goals. Um, Facebook obviously has a unique set of data um, and has a very unique uh, role to play, we believe. Um, however, sharing data for social good or uh, isn't necessarily new for the company. Um, our data for good uh, efforts have uh, been around for a couple of years now. Um, many of you might already be familiar with some of their data sets that they've shared or some of the tools that they're shared. Um, the high resolution population density data set, for example, is the most popular or one of the most popular data sets for download at a humanitarian data exchange. Um, and Facebook has a whole portfolio of uh, data sets that we're sharing actually on HDX um, that anyone can access. We also have a dedicated web portal dataforgood.fb.com where anyone can go and learn more about the methodology, the privacy, preserving techniques we're using when we share these data sets um, and get case studies of, of partners that have used them for, for different purposes. Um, broadly speaking, we think of four buckets um, when we think about our data sharing efforts at Facebook. Um, there's some insights that we can generate that are unique to our platform uh, and our tools. Um, and there are external data insights that we can share. So in some cases we use satellite imagery or, or other inputs and we use our computational powers or, or, or people to actually generate insights or tools, build tools from those. Um, we also build out new tools that we make, many times open source or, or in other ways accessible to our partners. And lastly, um, we think of sort of our computational powers and our human resources as a, as a resource that we can leverage to support partners that are working to achieve the SDGs. So those are four general buckets. Um, 
When we thought about where to start, I mean, SDG 17 and allows us to be pretty, pretty flexible when it comes to what we do, but we didn't want to just kind of dabber a little bit in all of the SDGs. We wanted to find a, a focus area uh, where we could really um, double down our investments as we started off um, a year or two ago. And we decided uh, to focus on gender equality, um, specifically gender data, um, for a lot of different reasons. And I'd love to um, talk a little bit more about them at a different point. But I think for now, I think we, it, it felt like Facebook has a unique responsibility um, with all the women who are using our services to find ways to um, empower organizations that are serving women um, and, and make sure that we promote the notion of gender disaggregate, gender data, um, and using um, a gender lens to investments and, and progress and in, in development. Um, however, this is not a field where we were uh, experts. So uh, at ANGA last year, Cheryl Sandberg, our COO, invited a set of experts and um, senior executives to a round table where we essentially asked them what, what some of the questions, what questions and priority areas they have that they currently can't answer with current data. So how could our non-traditional um, alternative data, if you will, um, social media data, um, how could that complement or, um, or um, uh, yeah, complement essentially ongoing um, efforts with using traditional data? Um, so we got a lot of really good ideas. Uh, we started off, uh, we had another series of roundtables around the world to really drill into the priority areas. Um, we um, teamed up with a group called Ladysmith. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a little bit more about Ladysmith shortly, but Ladysmith is a feminist research organization um, that has a really great track record of doing um, uh, gender lensed uh, gender data assessments. Um, so with Ladysmith and a couple of our private sector partners, um, we sat down and thought about how the tech sector in general could contribute more to the availability and the use of gender data. Um, specifically thinking about, you know, some of the specific SDGs that um, would benefit from additional gender data, but also which partners we think we could really um, work closely with and, and, and build more skills within these organizations to make sure that they have access and, and are able to use um, gender data. We also worked with DevEx um, to start some of these sort of capacity building or how-to tutorial series, specifically as COVID, um, I wanna say took over our lives, but really, um, you know, in February, March, changed a lot of our programming priorities. We all sort of had to turn around and, and revisit our plans. So partnering with DevEx um, was really great there where we were able to launch a bunch of uh, webinars um, to um, talk a little bit more about some of these gender data resources and, and just the insights that we had, the early insights that we had uh, around uh, the impact on COVID on women. Um, so here I will talk a little bit more about two new resources that we just launched uh, in September. So one is the survey on gender equality at home. This really goes to this notion of how social media or tech companies can provide non-traditional data to complement and triangulate uh, traditional efforts. Um, but also uh, our Gender Data 101 course, which we we bucket sort of as ecosystem investments. Um, and I'll I'll hammer this point a little bit, but I think just sharing data and making data available isn't enough um, to really transform uh, and speed up progress against the SDGs. We really need to do a lot of ecosystem investments, a lot of capacity building and, and offering open source tools um, to our partners to make sure that they can use this non-traditional uh, novel data. So first, the gender survey. Um, I spent many years um, first working with GIZ um, in Southern Africa and then uh, with the World Bank in their ICT and digital development data team. And this idea of, of surveying was always a challenge, but a must, you know, sort of a very important source of, of data collection for us. 
um, when I joined Facebook, I brought this notion with me and, and it just couldn't sort of let go of the idea of, of the ability a company like Facebook would have to survey a global community. Um, obviously, um, there are caveats and challenges and, and limitations to that type of survey as there is with all kinds of surveying, but um, I'm, so, I'm so happy that we were able to first sit down with our, our experts at last year's roundtable and really understand what they needed to know and then transform that and go back um, to our offices and really develop a very solid survey. So um, uh, in mid-September, we launched uh, the Gender Equality at Home report. Um, it started off not having a COVID effort, a uh, COVID focus, obviously, because this was, we scoped this pre-COVID, but in February, March, we quickly added a set of questions that also uh, sought to inform uh, the COVID impact uh, on when women and, and girls. So um, there's a, this was surveyed, uh, I believe some almost 500,000 Facebook users uh, answered this survey. Um, it reached two, a little more than 200 countries. Um, the survey was filled in over 80 languages um, and the respondents answered 30 questions, which if you're, you know, if you're into surveys and, and survey methodology, you know that 30 questions is a lot. Um, we had really good response rates and didn't have that big dropout rates, um, which I'm really excited about. Um, and just want to make a plug, actually, I think next slide has a couple of um, methodology pieces. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to point you to, there's a methodology page on our Data for Good work portal where you can dig into um, the technical aspects of the methodology, how we went about, how we structured the questions, etc. But some of the really cool findings, um, and again, thanks to Lady Smith, uh, a research partner here that um, pulled out all of these uh, global findings, but also regional findings. We have regional briefs um, for anyone that wants to dig in deeper uh, insights into kind of their specific region. So um, we, we could confirm. So um, in some cases, we had information from our survey that confirmed traditional beliefs, and in some cases, actually contradicted traditional beliefs, which is really interesting. But we, um, some of these things are not a surprise. Uh, women were more likely than men to report spending time cooking and cleaning, um, and had uh, many, many areas reported an increase in chores. Um, ready to unpair, unpaid care and domestic work. Um, I should also say that this, the uniqueness of the survey is not only its vast uh, sample size and global reach, but also the fact that it was able to survey these communities in a time where, you know, face-to-face -face surveys just wasn't an option um, as, as the pandemic kind of started rolling out. Um, next slide, you'll see a couple of um, other uh, survey insights related to COVID. Um, in Latin American Caribbean, respondents are very concerned about access to healthcare. Uh, North America and East Pacific had a lot of concerns about money to sustain livelihoods and families. Um, other areas were impacted by school cancellations and job losses. And specifically for this community listening today, I think the next slide that talks a little bit about the food security concerns might be of interest. Um, more than 25% of respondents in most regions reported recently experiencing food security. This survey was filled in July, so this is really a couple of months into COVID. Um, and I just want to remind you all that this, um, this survey is surveying Facebook respondents. And in most countries, in most places, Facebook users are not the worst off. Uh, they will have access to internet and a cell phone, etc. So it was quite striking to me that even this group of people that I hadn't expect would maybe be in the most vulnerable sections, of, uh, se uh, vulnerable segments of the country, still 25% of those reported uh, concerns around food security, um, which I think is, um, yeah, it's really sad and something we need to think about as we, as we uh, increase investments and, and do programming going forward. Um, I'm not going to go through, you might have to click through the slide, I'm not going to go through all of these four um, points, but I just wanted to show one, one strong belief I have when we do these non-traditional data efforts, when we try to kind of complement existing uh, 
statistical teams or other types of resources is it's really important to scope these and develop them in partnership with um, whoever will use them. So in this case, the World Bank Group, we worked very closely to the World, with the World Bank Group in actually designing the survey making sure that some of the questions that we asked in the survey were the same or very similar or comparable to questions that they ask in their household surveys um, to make sure that we would get to that point where we have data that's comparable uh, or insights that um, can do additional uh, research on. Um, Moving on from the survey, um, I just wanted to give you a um, heads up about this gender uh, online gender data 101 course. Um, as I mentioned, some of our thinking around um, non-traditional data sharing or data for good, uh, it's really important to also think about ecosystem investments. We cannot just share the data, we also need to make sure that the partner organizations have the right skills or the tools to be able to use these um, novel data sets. Um, and one way we, we are working on that is we partnered with Tech Change um, to create a Gender Data 101 course. Um, as of early October, uh, it was made um, open uh, and free for anyone to want to, to take it in their own pace, so kind of a self-paced course. Um, but we launched a pilot session in May and I, I had some really great results and a lot of interest. So I just wanted to kind of share some of those data with you. Um, on the next slide, you'll see um, kind of the structure of the data, uh, Gender Data 101 course. Um, and um, on the following slide, you'll actually see sort of a interest in the course. We had massive interest. It was oversubscribed um, and we had to open up additional spots for people to join in. But this is really encouraging. I think it just shows that there's a big interest out there. There's a large and growing demand for um, gender data uh, use, but also skills related to how to, um, how to deploy these. Um, the next slide actually shows some really good um, uh, skills assessments and uh, showing results of how people actually felt like they um, learned what they needed to learn um, and um, the fact that this out, out the fact that the completion rate uh, and retention rate uh, outperformed traditional MOOCs with like 30 percent was really exciting to see um, and that's one of the reasons why we made this course available for anyone. Um, so to kind of hammer down on this point um, the good practices, good practices we have uh, from um, sharing non-traditional data and building these um, data sets to share with the world is that it's really important to also think about the ecosystem investment and building skills. Um, our friends at TechChange wrote a recent article in um, Stanford uh, Technology Review. I left the address down in the bottom if you want to read the whole thing. But there are four recommendations which um, we had kind of worked out with them uh, are included on this slide. Um, I also left a couple of logos of organizations that we have worked with throughout this year to really think of how our support can be complementary. There are other tech companies doing really great work to support SDG um, partners um, and also um, gender data or technology partnership um, efforts that are also trying to kind of double down on, on these insights. Um, I, you know, I'm really thankful to be able to share these uh, insights and these results here um, and look forward to answer some of your questions later on in the Q&A session. Now I want to hand over to uh, Astrid and Dennis from uh, Dahlberg's Data Insights. Thank you very much, Anna, and I'm uh, very happy to follow you on this uh, presentation, especially because of both projects are mirroring um, quite a bit. So hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Astrid Valiant. I'm a senior project manager at Delbert Data Insight. Um, it's a company leveraging big data and new technologies to address social and economic global challenges. Uh, we are effective in different types of fields, 
going from public health to agriculture, economic uh, access to uh, renewable energy, and, and of course, uh, gender inclusion. I'm here today uh, with my great colleague, Denis Semensoff, uh, tech lead at uh, Denver Data Insight. Um, so if we are here today is uh, because we would like to uh, present you our project where we leverage uh, what we call CDR, so call detail records, mainly telecom data um, to um, address, to predict sex and um, gender economic impairment. Uh, call detail records can actually um, be leveraged for different type of um, field indicator, uh, as you can see on this slide, but here we are going to focus on gender and uh, economic activity. Uh, this project has been supported by uh, different other um, organizations than Alba Data Insight, uh, where you can see all the logo of those uh, organizations on this slide. Before jumping into the um, the real uh, core of, of I would say the, the model, the technical model we, we develop, I would like just to take a little uh, step backward and, and give a little bit of context uh, or to this project. So um, nowadays, uh, women are producing more than half of the world food, and uh, we are yet still uh, facing a systematic gender gap. If we want to address this uh, gender gap, and it has been explained uh, by Anna in her previous um, presentation, we need information, we need data. We do have data on some women, but we don't have data on all the women. So if you want to deploy inclusive campaign, making sure that no one is left behind, we need to make sure that we can gather all those data from all the women. The problem is that we don't have survey that can cover all the different regions. Not everyone has access to social media or other way to provide those information. Um, by having those information, we can know information such as in this illustrative example, there is a woman in a, a specific region of uh, Uganda that is married, she has three children, she's a subsistence farmer, meaning that um, she uses her own uh, production for her own family. She owns a house uh, with her husband and would like to actually invest in a plot for agriculture. By having those information, we can deploy campaigns, uh, action that makes sure that uh, Abo can have access to financial loans, for instance, to invest in a plot for agriculture and move from subsistence farmer to commercial farmers. This is how uh, we can empower women. But the problem is that we don't have those data. So what can we do actually to um, address this uh, data gap? And this is something that uh, we do um, at Delba Data Insight is to develop model that can predict sex and, economic and, and women economic power by uh, leveraging telecom data and machine learning. So by analyzing mobile, uh, mobile usage and those mobile usage, those mobile actually cover majority of, of the population, we can uh, predict different variables. The first one is gender. And the second one here in our example is uh, women economic impairment. So what do we mean by women economic um, impairment? It's three different sub variable, but sub variable, sorry. The first one is what is the occupation of the woman? Is she a subsistence farmer, commercial farmers, or unemployed, uh, housewife, uh, etc.? cetera? Um, what is her um, decision power in this household? What, what, what her decision uh, has an impact in uh, the household uh, compared to her husband? And finally, is this woman uh, owning a land or uh, a house? So that's the three sub variables that uh, we decided to select to define uh, economic impairment in this context. So that's, I would say, like the, in a nutshell, uh, the model that uh, we developed. And so this model aims to generate data on women and women and fill the gender gap. Um, we deployed this model in Uganda. Uh, it was approximately one year ago. And the project methodology contains three phases. I will go over them very quickly, but Dennis uh, will explain you more into the details with his technical um, lens and expertise. Uh, how do we develop such a model? So the first phase is to collect ground through data to create the base of, of the model. And uh, we launched a phone survey um, in, in Uganda that was a representative of, of the population to gather a population sample and to ask questions about uh, sex and economic impairment. Then uh, we built a machine learning model to predict the sex and women economic impairment indicator based on mobile, mobile usage. So with the ground through data, we could actually predict through the machine learning model 
what was uh, the sex and the woman economic employment for the whole uh, user base of the telecom operator. And then finally, we evaluate the model and then uh, we interpret the result. By doing so, we can create uh, new uh, granular, timely and cost efficient data about women. Uh, this is an ex illustrative example, but then we can then uh, predict and, and, and produce insights on data such as, for instance, in Elgon region, which is the same region of Abo, the woman that I uh, introduced you to at the beginning of this illustrative example. 20.6% of the women are, the same, are in the same situation than Abo. They are subsistence farmer and they have a fair decision-making power in the household uh, and they co-own our house. So if we want to help uh, those portion of the population of women to be unparent, we might uh, create a campaign or like an action to um, help them to have access to a financial loan to invest in uh, an agricultural land. By doing so, we provide data to empower women and then uh, we provide insightful action to international organization to address uh, the SCG number five, which is about gender equality. Um, now I will let the floor to Denise uh, that will go into uh, more the details, the technical details of, of the model. Uh, and then after that, we will go into the result, the outcome and what are the next step in the application. Denise, over to you. Hello everyone and thank you Astrid. My name is Denis Semenzov. I'm a tech lead at Dahlberg Data Insights and I'm going to talk about the first three phases, phases of the uh, implementation on this project. Um, first and foremost, uh, in any machine learning process, you have to have what we call a crown truth data. Uh, this is the initial data and localization of your user base that you train your model on. Um, this lets you understand whether you're right in your prediction and frankly, you cannot do any predictions without this. So knowing how important it is, we designed, meticulously designed the uh, survey and targeted a specific representative subset of respondents within the country, making sure that we cover such questions as um, sex, age, Marital status, the ownership of the SIM card, the main occupation, uh, household decision power, and the uh, ownership of the land and the house. We make sure that the set is representative, meaning that the split between the um, genders is the same as in the whole country. It's also representative on the urban and rural division and the geographic division. Um, the once the data is, uh, ground truth data is collected, we now uh, look into the data that we have. And for this particular machine learning engagement, we have four types of data, which is standard call data records, um, antennas location to uh, connect the data to the geograph geography of the country, then the ground truth information that we gathered in the phase one, and then the mobile mining data. Uh, which uh, tended out to be very important as well. The uh, feature instruction um, as the part of the working um, with the data is the essential part in the pipeline of the machine learning. We uh, not only take variables as, as they are, but we actually perform a correlational analysis and the go through the uh, feature, structure, feature extraction process where we combine uh, variables, create new variables, code and code some, some categorical variables to make sure that we cover as much variation of the data set as, as possible. And of course, make this data set too representative and make this data set readable by a machine. We cover machine, phone usage, um, we cover the um, social network indicators, mobility patterns, top up patterns, and other indicators like the uh, geography split, the um, home ownership, et cetera. Um, then we come to actual machine learning modeling, um, which is an algorithm that was developed by us that combines many types of models and is completely uh, bias free meaning that there is no human involvement in the selection and fine tuning of the model. 
once the feature extraction is done, we feed this data to a complex algorithm that loops through all the uh, types of model that are known to perform the best uh, with this kind of data based on our experience and based on other scientific papers and chooses the best model out of them. It moreover uses the so-called Bayesian optimization to fine tune and uh, find the optimal set of hyperparameters that uh, makes the model perform the best. Then, of course, we train the model that has chosen for the prediction of certain social um, uh, features and the um, things that we are interested in on, the, on our data set and look at the result. Um, as from our, um, from, from this engagement, it turns out that the two models that perform the best on this type of data and on this data set specifically are the support vector machines with radial basis function kernel and the extreme gradient boosting. Those two are uh, known to be very good for the categorical data, but have their own tricks. Um, both of them are, are trained using Bayesian hyperparameters optimization, and then, as you see, show significant improve of the uh, accuracy compared to the baseline percentage. Um, we uh, then come to the very important step in the machine learning, which is a um, comparing accuracy and validating the results of the machine learning algorithm. First, we make sure uh, that the model is representative with or no categorization, split it between oral, oral and rural, and that is representative and uh, inside the geographical regions. And moreover, that the accuracy of our predictions persists through all three of those categories. Then what we do as part of this engagement and uh, as something um, that Astrid will talk in, 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 in the future about is that we perform two kind of tricks um, to see if our model is um, accurate and then to actually make this model a bit more women-centric. We first uh, do so-called reverse gender prediction from the economic empowerment. What we do is that we see uh, if we can work with the data set that we have and use the predicted social um, metrics based on the ground truth data and those uh, performance uh, machine learning algorithms to feed them back to the machine learning algorithms and from them predict the gender again and see if the um, accuracy of predicting uh, gender of the uh, subscribers will increase. Uh, that lets us um, do a one-step um, perform, so to say, out of sample uh, experiment where we um, um, engineer features based on the predictions that we did in the in the previous phase. Then what we do is the gender specific model. Uh, we take out all the um, male uh, population from the data and train the model only on the female user base. That lets us to get rid of the um, variation of the of the uh, data based on the gender. By knowing that the gender of the data set is the same, we can increase the prediction of the social economic variables. And this is something that we that we prove given the result. Of course, we are open for any questions about the model and the process. And thank you very much. Back to you, Astrid. Thank you very much, uh, Denise. Um, so now we arrive to the final phase, which is about the final results. Um, and so we had different type of deliveries for, for this project. The first one was uh, the, the result of the prediction. Um, as Denise mentioned, we did it in a different way. So first, uh, the result we made without categorization. 
And then we did the whole result by splitting uh, the different regions between urban and rural to, to see if there is any uh, difference. And then uh, we did um, a third classification where we split the result by uh, geographical regions to really understand what is the um, situation in every single geographic uh, region of, of Uganda. So that's it's a screenshot of, of the type of uh, result sheet that the model um, generates. Um, the second um, delivery is actually from the first one, where we develop uh, an interactive and online um, dashboard tool for CGR, where they can um, select uh, different variables and have uh, instantly a very uh, comprehensive result mapping of the situation in the country per region, where they can, for instance, select um, um, a variable such as subsistence farmer and see the result on the country and what is the um, proportion of women being farmer or subsistence farmer versus commercial farmers. What is the proportion of women owning a land versus uh, owning a house uh, per region? And, and by doing so, you can really support uh, more strategic and, and, and um, comprehensive decision making for our international and local organization um, willing to achieve uh, gender inclusion. Um, the last delivery of, of this work uh, with, GSM, uh, with C CGR is to um, uh, develop a research paper. Uh, it's under development at the moment, uh, but we would be very happy to uh, share with you uh, when it will be uh, public. Uh, so that's for the results. Um, in terms of next steps and, and application, um, we would like, of course, to, to continue on, on this work. We already deployed this model in other uh, projects, uh, in other countries, sorry, with, uh, with other organization in other countries of, of Africa and, and also um, um, in, in, in Asia. But what we would like to do, if you really want to um, validate uh, this pilot and, and make it more stronger, is to um, add new indicators. So at the moment, we are predicting uh, sex and um, economic uh, unemployment, but why not predicting other factors such as, for instance, access to renewable energy, for instance, um, enhance the existing indicator. So we found out after that, for instance, the decision-making indicator was not always um, clear for everyone. Uh, it can be interpreted in various different manner, you know, like what is the decision making of someone in a household can be so many things. So that's something that uh, we can uh, work on. Um, apply the, the, the model on other and additional geographies and enhance the survey. Uh, making sure that we reduce any potential misinterpretation or we can make it more sustainability, uh, sustainable. And this is how having this presentation of Anna uh, before us makes total sense because I think partnership with um, Project 17 could make sense for, for this project because then you can make uh, the collect of grant for data way more sustainable and, and up to date with time. Um, how can we use this pilot as previously shown in, in, in the deliveries, um, it actually uh, generates uh, data. So it can complete existing service. It can complete it by bringing new insight, but it also can challenge existing service by bringing new insight and see like which one has the, the most uh, accuracy. Um, it can help to support decision-making by targeting and define better intervention in terms of campaign. Uh, you can deploy one campaign in one region uh, and then find out that actually this campaign cannot be as impactful in a different region, in another region. So it's very important to, to have a tool that can help you to be as granular as, as possible. Um, or you can also use uh, this model to um, do impact assessment. So you can run the model before a campaign and run the model after a campaign and then it will help you to evaluate what was the impact of your, of your campaign. For instance, if you want to launch a financial uh, loans, com loans campaign in a, in a region and see if it could help actually the woman to access uh, specific resources that uh, you wanted to uh, aim to uh, during your campaign. So that's um, to conclude our presentation. 
Um, I think we will go into a Q&A session right now. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. It was really a pleasure uh, presenting you this, uh, this project and, and feel free to, to reach me out uh, on my email address and uh, I will make sure also to put you in contact uh, with Dennis if needed. Thank you very much.